Michael, Michael Reed, Reed on, on LMFM. LMFM. The Rape Crisis Network Ireland group says uh, that early intervention in children's lives is uh, the strongest commitment we can make to prevention and protection from sexual violence. And understanding the experience of adolescents is the first step to shaping interventions that work. Yesterday, it published Storm and Stress, an Exploration of Sexual Harassment Among Adolescents. Uh, the author of this is uh, Dr. Michelle Walsh, who joins us now. And good morning to you, Michelle, and thank to you indeed uh, for joining us on the programme. Good morning, Michael. Thanks for having me on. You, you spent a year talking to 600 young people uh, across uh, the country about their experiences. What did you hear from them? Okay, so I, I did, yeah. I, I spoke to 600 adolescents up and down the country. Um, and I'm telling you, like, it's, it's fairly, fairly shocking, to be honest with you. Um, I knew that I was going to encounter some level of sexual harassment, but I wasn't prepared at all for what I did uncover. So basically 80% of the adolescents that I interviewed disclosed um, being subjected to some form of sexual violence. Um, another 78% of them said that sexual harassment happened very frequently among their peers. Mm. Um, 28% of them said that they had witnessed physical or extreme forms of sexual harassment with only, like, I think I had 83% said they had witnessed some form of sexual harassment that they didn't, that, that you know, the, the, the person on the receiving end of it didn't want to happen. Mm. But 28% of them had witnessed severe physical extreme forms of sexual harassment and we're talking about you know down to to rape here and um, the findings clearly display a pattern of sexual harassment that's been perpetrated against adolescents and mm. um, with much of this abuse being perpetrated by their peers unfortunately that is very shocking um, very shocking to me uh, yeah. I, I, I'm surprised to some degree that it, it would be as shocking to you uh, as somebody who's worked as a, a rape crisis counsellor uh, and you're now the clinical lead for the yeah. rape crisis network uh, but yeah. it, it's so bad that you're even shocked by this I am, I was absolutely and utterly like, I suppose when you sit down with the adolescents and you talk to them and you have kids coming up to you going writing on the end of questionnaires going thank you so much for talking to me because nobody wants to talk to us about this um, like I had one adolescent tell me you know if this was happening in the adult population there'd be loads happening yeah. but no, nobody wants to do anything about this and I suppose um, it, it, it's the sheer levels um, and again what was coming out loud and, and, and clear was that um, you know if you were your gender um, and your orientation, your sexual orientation, um, really increased the risk of experiencing sexual harassment. Mm. So girls are something like two and a half times more likely to experience sexual harassment than than boys. And if you were LGBTQ, mm. you were nearly three times more likely to experience it. Right. Um, and it's shocking. You know, yeah. some of the stories are really, really devastating, life-altering consequences. Mm. And is, again, it, is it because of the normalisation of things that our generation would have uh, looked on as being extreme? I, I don't know. I think it's the, it's the normalisation within society as a whole of, mm. you know, th- that this can just happen. That, um, And I think it's the normalisation or, or the exclusion of looking at adolescents and younger children. Mm. Um, and, and just kind of, I suppose, not taking account of what's actually happening in that generation, which, if you think about it, the adolescents of today are going to be the young adults that we see in third level tomorrow mm. and the, the future generation. And, you know, if, if you mm. experience sexual harassment in adolescence or childhood, you are something like 19 times more likely to experience further um, abuse into your adulthood. There's probably few adolescents listening to us uh, this morning, Michelle, but for the mothers and fathers who might be listening to us, uh, what would you say to them if they think that's probably somebody else's child? It's not. I mean, this is a representative sample of adolescents across the country. I interviewed adolescents in every county in Ireland, um, and this is a nationwide problem. Um, there's no way that I just pick 600 adolescents mm-hmm. and it's only happening to 80% of them. And uh, I think we need to start educating, we need to start talking to our children about um, what's normal, what's acceptable, what they're going through and where they can go for help. And we need to start 
educating them. And really what's need to start bringing that into schools? And what's unacceptable? And what they can do? And give yeah. them tools, give them a, a way of acting if something unacceptable is happening. Exactly, and but we need, you know, we we need an infrastructure that supports that as well. And I suppose, um, you know, this is an awful lot of social norms, what we're conditioned to, you know. Um, you know, give Auntie Mary a kiss um, because she just bought you something, even though you don't like Auntie Mary. I mean, that's teaching somebody that they haven't got bodily autonomy over their own body and they have to give somebody a kiss for giving them a gift. Mm. And, and it's stuff like that. We need to look at how we're conditioning and how we're socialising our children and we need to educate them to understand that they don't have to do this um, and that things can be better. And unfortunately, the education that we're providing at the moment isn't quite meeting, but it isn't fit for purpose. We need to update and we need to educate um, and we need to promote zero tolerance of sexual harassment. Mm. And we need holistic support for survivors um, and we need interventions for perpetrators. We need to, like, because I think an awful lot of adolescents are inadvertently perpetrators as well. Yeah, you know, and and, I, and yeah. if there's one lesson to teach your children, is it that nothing is expected of you? Um, I think that's a blanket thing to say, that mm. nothing is expected of you. But I think we need to be teaching, we need to understand what consent is. Mm. Um, and we need to make our children or help our children to understand what they can consent to. I mean, there's always going to be things with children that we have, they have to do um, whether they consent to it or not. It's like mm. changing a baby's nappy. You have to do it whether you like it or not. Mm. But there are things that you can have autonomy. Like you can change a child's nappy and you can go, I know you might not like me doing this at the moment, but mm. I'm going to do this because you need me to do it. But you can ask their permission. Mm. We, we can start re-educating ourselves as to what, what consent actually is in an everyday mm. But for the girls, for example, you don't have to do this because uh, the other girls are doing it and you don't have to do that because uh, the boys expect it of you because the other girls are doing it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Michelle, I have to leave there. I'm out of time. I wish we had more time, but thank you for your time and for joining us this morning. That's uh, Dr. Michelle much. Walsh, who's the clinical lead with the Rape Crisis Network of Ireland. Michael, Michael Reed on, on LMFM. LMFM.